There are a few significant references to taxes in the Gospels, and, as usually happens, when you look at them closely, you discover that the churches have done a good job of distorting virtually all of them. I want to examine what Jesus actually said about paying taxes, and about our relationship with the governments of man in this video. Let's start at the end and work backwards. At his trial, Jesus was accused of forbidding people to give tribute to Caesar. Although Pilate was not convinced that Jesus really was trying to incite insurrection against the Roman Empire, the question of whether or not Jesus was encouraging his disciples to disobey the occupation forces was something that the Jewish leaders saw as problematic. And I think it is still problematic today. Before declaring that he saw nothing treasonous in what Jesus stood for, Pilate asked Jesus straight out whether Jesus was the King of the Jews. Jesus' answer, as we'll see in another reference later, was cryptic. You say it, is what the King James Version records him as saying. Young's literal translation says that he replied, You do say. Either way, this could be understood as meaning anything from, that's what you say, but not what I say, and that does seem to be what Pilate assumed he was saying, to something like, spot on, you hit the nail on the head, yes, I am the king of the Jews. But my main point is that the issue was a hot one, both then and now. So let's back up in the Gospels to the specific encounter that happened between the Jewish leaders and Jesus, which led to the Pharisees believing that Jesus really did think that his authority was greater than that of Caesar's. It's covered in all three of the Synoptic Gospels, which is another hint that this issue is important. Here is Matthew's version, and they are all very similar. They straight out ask, Is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? Jesus recognizes that they are trying to trap him. Now, this is a very important clue before we even touch on what Jesus says in reply, a clue as to what Jesus' real position was. You would not ask any of the big name evangelists in the world today, is it wrong to pay taxes? Matter of fact, you would not even ask such a question of any of the little name evangelists in the world today. They would all vow and declare that it is wrong not to pay your taxes. They might give some excuses for paying as little tax as possible to comfort those members of the congregation who manipulate things to get maximum tax deductions, but the bottom line is still that all good Christians pay their taxes. Isn't that right? We would rarely think otherwise. So why did the Pharisees see a need to ask Jesus such a question in the first place? And why does Luke say that Jesus perceived their craftiness by asking such a question? Why does Mark say that they were trying to catch Jesus in his words? And why does Matthew record that Jesus accused them of being wicked hypocrites because they were trying to tempt him? Bear in mind what the political situation was like at that time. All good Jews supposedly believed that their nation was led by God that it was above any of the other kingdoms of the world. And yet, the country had been invaded by Roman armies, and the people had been forced to live under Roman rule. They were all struggling with conflicting loyalties at this time, quite apart from any kingdom that Jesus might be building. Whether the tension is between loyalty to the kingdom of Israel versus the Roman Empire, or whether the tension is between loyalty to the kingdom of heaven, as Jesus taught it, versus the various governments which each of us live under today, what you will find to be most consistent in both, or should we say all, as far as the tension between church and state, is that the religious leaders will ultimately side with the state. Listen to the religious leaders at Jesus' trial. They not only accused Jesus of preaching another kingdom, which of course he did, but they loudly declared that their first loyalty was not to that other kingdom, nor to the kingdom of Israel, in the event that the two kingdoms were different. John records it in his account of the trial of Jesus. It says, From that point on, Pilate sought to release Jesus. But the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. They were seriously claiming to be more loyal to Caesar than Caesar's own appointed governor. 
That is just how fanatically pro-human government they were. And it is pretty much the position of churches everywhere today. Given the opportunity, they would all be playing golf with the president and laying hands on him in order to curry favor from the various governments of man. John goes on to say that the religious leaders were shouting, Kill him! Kill him! To which Pilate replied, Do you want me to kill your king? Maybe Pilate was just being sarcastic. He could certainly see through the hypocrisy of the religious leaders. Even today, Jews would have us to believe that the reason they have rejected Jesus is that he did not have the right credentials to qualify as a Messiah. But that is simply not true. What they wanted was not a Messiah. What they wanted was a Caesar. And almost any Caesar would do. Listen to them. The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. And they still have no king. And they still have no Messiah. But one day soon, the ultimate worldly king is going to rule the world, very likely from their precious so-called holy city, and they are going to fall down and worship him. But most disturbing than that is that most, if not all of these chief priests of the church world will be right there beside them, groveling to the Jews, promoting their city and blessing their temple, even though all of it will be coming from the ultimate source of evil. But let's get back to what Jesus himself said in reply to this trap that was being set for him. The trap, you see, was aimed specifically at forcing him to take an open stand against the ruling government of his day. He had been asked whether it was lawful or right, as most modern translations put it, to pay Roman taxes. Jesus says, give me a coin. And then he asks, whose picture is this on the coin? Obviously, both the coin and the picture had come from Caesar. Caesar made the money and he put his picture on it. And money is what people use to pay taxes and to do all forms of business in the various systems of man. Nevertheless, in a few short years, this will no longer be the case. There will be no coins, no cash, no other forms of money apart from a special mark in our right hand or in our forehead with which to pay taxes and with which to do all business transactions. That mark will have been created by the rulers of this world. And the question we need to very soberly ask ourselves is this, is it right to take that mark in order to pay our taxes, in order to provide for our families, in order to be good citizens? The various governments of the world are even now working towards greater unity in shifting us from a cash-based society to an electronic one, one which will soon be able to identify every person on the planet. The question and how we answer it is crucial. So Jesus asked them, who made the money? And they tell him that it was the ruling Roman government that made it. A government which many early Christians believed to be the government of the predicted Antichrist. And then Jesus gives his answer. Render to Caesar. So there you have it. Straight from the lips of the Son of God, the King of Kings, the Jewish Messiah. He said it himself. Render to Caesar. Oh, what a sigh of relief must have spread through the crowd that day. And a much bigger sigh of relief has spread around the world ever since, as preachers everywhere have been telling us that Jesus said to render to Caesar. But what is missing? Can you spot it? Over and over again on this channel, I've pointed out how almost everything that Jesus has said has been twisted to mean virtually the opposite, when all we really need to do is to pay attention to what he really said. And this is no exception. Listen to the full quote. Render to Caesar that which is Caesar's, and to God that which is God's. Can you see the difference? Yes, like Jesus' answer to Pilate when asked whether he was the king of the Jews, the statement that comes out of Jesus' mouth is one of great wisdom and a little ambiguity. He knows how people think. They will all hear what they want to hear. And so all that the masses have heard from that very important quotation have been the first three words, or perhaps the first seven words, render to Caesar that which is Caesar's. 
This message has been preached for centuries, almost like it's the 11th commandment, but only for those who cannot even imagine a government controlled by anyone greater than just one more Caesar. But there is a very tiny handful of people who have listened to the second half of the statement, which is summed up in the words, give to God what belongs to God. That is what Jesus said, give to God what belongs to God. But he hid it from the minds of the rich and powerful by the way he started the sentence out. There is nothing deceptive in what he said. It is totally correct. Each one of us must work out for ourselves where our loyalty begins. On the basis of our biases, we will arrive at quite opposite conclusions and quite opposite lifestyles. Most of the world starts with Caesar and gives God the leftovers, while those of us who are able to see that invisible kingdom of heaven which Jesus represented start with God and then decide how much of the leftovers they are able to give to Caesar without compromising their faithfulness and obedience to Jesus. But, but what about Paul? I invariably have people asking. Now, those of you who know me best would not be surprised to see me shrug my shoulders and reply, what about Paul? Do you really think I care if Paul contradicts what Jesus said and did? Paul isn't the son of God. Paul didn't die for my sins. Paul cannot save me. Jesus alone has the words of eternal life. But if for nothing more than to show how the process grows after one first chooses to reject what really happened in that exchange between Jesus and the religious leaders over taxes, if for no other reason than that, I'll look at what Paul has said about service to worldly governments. His thoughts on the topic are mostly summed up in the 13th chapter of his letter to Christians in Rome, where the Roman government was most powerful. Paul virtually quotes what Jesus said in the 7th verse of this chapter. In the first six verses, he was admonishing Christians to submit to all who are in authority. He went so far as to say that whatever authorities exist have been put there by God to reward the good and punish the evil. But he doesn't come right out and identify these authorities as being the governments of man. Like Jesus, Paul appears to have worded this in such a way that it could either apply to the Roman government under which they lived or to Christian leaders in general within the fellowship of believers. Then Paul gives his readers the seventh verse, letting them decide who it is that is really worthy of honor and who it is that we should really fear. In case his meaning is not clear, Paul expresses great wisdom in the eighth verse of this chapter, where he says quite bluntly, Owe no man anything. In other words, even if we do choose to submit to some of the ordinances of human governments, it's important for each of us to be clear in our own minds that it's not about us being obligated to obey anyone. We do not owe anyone the ultimate loyalty that must be to God. Out of love, but not out of fear, there is room for cooperating with the various systems of man. But when any of those systems demand that we cross a certain line, something which compromises our Christian faith, then we must, with Peter and the other apostles, say to the various rulers of the world, we must obey God rather than men. That is the bottom line. We ought to ultimately obey God and not any human authorities. Now let's return to another incident with regard to taxes, one that only Matthew included in his account of the life and teachings of Jesus. Someone came to Peter this time, not Jesus, asking Peter what his take was on paying taxes. Let me just clarify something here which is open to dispute. The original Greek says that they asked Peter about a specific tax with a specific value, two drachmas. It was a relatively minor tax, not much more than a dollar in today's value, two grams of silver, one for each drachma. However, because a specific value is given for this tax in the Greek, many modern translations have inserted into this passage two words that do not appear in the original, stating that they constitute a temple tax and not a tax to be paid to the Roman rulers. 
They have done this on the basis of a tiny rule in the Old Testament that Jews were to pay a tax of a half of a shekel toward the maintenance of the temple. Now, half a shekel would have been worth about four times as much as the two drachmas that are mentioned with regard to the tax in this passage. But that discrepancy is overlooked at the same time that the words temple tax are inserted. Now, I'm not an expert on Greek, so it is possible that they were asking about the temple tax without the passage actually saying so, but it's certainly not clear that it's a temple tax. In fact, there appears to be more evidence to suggest otherwise. The liberty that has been taken with regard to translating it as a temple tax may be part of a larger attempt to steer the general public away from anything that would make more clear the powerful implications of what Jesus said in that more public and more famous encounter with the Pharisees about rendering to God what belongs to God. I say this because in the next verse, Jesus refers to the kings of the world, and he refers to taxes which are paid to the kings of the world. This is all done with no mention of the Jewish temple. Ultimately, however, the point is still this. We are under obligation to no one. As Paul implied in Romans 13 verse 8, we owe no man anything except to show love. But we have here, in Matthew's Gospel, a much clearer expression of what Jesus' real position is on obligations of any sort towards the various governments of the world. And yet I would not be surprised if 99 church attenders out of 100 have never heard a sermon preached on this intimate glimpse into something Jesus shared very privately with his disciples. Why? Isn't it because this story is much harder to twist than the earlier one, where you just quote, render to Caesar and leave the rest out, in order to achieve the desired distortion? So, what happens after Peter is approached on the subject? Peter, like most religious leaders would do today, gives a knee-jerk response. Yes, he declares, of course we pay our taxes. Jesus avoids a public disagreement between himself and his most impetuous disciple, waiting until he can speak to Peter more privately, and then he asks Peter a leading question. Do the children of the king need to pay taxes? What is Jesus doing here? He's trying to get Peter to think. To think about what it means to be adopted into the family of the king of kings. About what it means to have discovered a greater kingdom a higher revelation of authority than the systems and governments of man. And Jesus wants Peter to conclude what we have just heard Paul say, which is that we owe no man anything. Read it for yourself. The children of the King of Kings are free. This use of the word free is a very good choice. It hints at why it is not easy to categorically state the Christian position in relation to earthly governments. We are free not to abide by the laws of the land. But, at the same time, we are free to abide by those laws. The primary issue here is not whether or not we obey a law, but whether or not we are acting in faith and love. Someone has said, True freedom is not to be found in being bound to a rule, nor is it to be found in being bound away from a rule. But instead, it is that glorious feeling that you get when you know you are doing God's will. In so many areas of our Christian walk, we need to learn how to take it or leave it, based on whether it is God's highest plan for us. And that's why the next verse is so important. Nevertheless, Jesus said. <laughs> what an interesting word. It introduces something which kind of contradicts what has just been said. We are free not to obey the laws of the land. Nevertheless, and that is where Jesus goes ahead and pays the tax, but he does so in a way that makes it clear we don't have to get a job and earn money in order to keep the Caesars of the world happy. He and his disciples, then and now, continue to refuse to work for mammon. Trusting our Heavenly Father to provide the means to pay such a tax if he thinks it is better to pay it than to unnecessarily offend someone by not paying it. We need to stay constantly open to his leadings about which position is right for each situation. 
It's very likely why Peter mistakenly answered too quickly in saying that his master paid taxes. Our position as Christians must be to cooperate as much as possible with the various governments and organizations in the world, but not to the point of being obligated to do that. There are many places in the world today where it is unlawful to share your faith as a Christian. Most of the world demands that citizens be prepared to kill enemies of the government in times of war, and one day will not be able to buy or sell anywhere in the world without first accepting a mark in our right hand or on our forehead. In all such situations, we must obey God rather than man and we should be willing to literally die before we would back down. Are you ready for that? The closer we get to the return of Christ, and the closer we get to what He taught, the more courage it is going to take to stay single-minded in terms of our loyalty to God. We are working on developing that kind of dedication even now as we band together in preparation for that final showdown. If you'd like to do the same, please contact us at the address shown on the screen. I look forward to hearing from you today. God bless you.